So, a lot of you know, okay, and if you don't know, I'm an instructor and I have the privilege of actually teaching the freshman biology labs. And what's really neat about that class is that I go ahead and I have a whole vast array of students that I get to teach that have different interests. And the thing is, is that they all want to go ahead and start out with the subject that is their pre-professional category that they have chosen. I have people who are, vastly majority of them are pre-meds, pre-dents, fairly recently, okay, are the physician assistants. I get a smattering of people who are pre-farm, some pre-physical therapy, okay, some pre-optometry. But the one thing that they all have to do, okay, and go through, is they have to go through the freshman labs, and then they have to go through the animal diversity. Now, the thing is, is that they discover, okay, that they're really going to start talking and learning about subjects that have nothing to do with their professional background that they want to pursue, okay? So, they quickly discover, you know, you're going to learn about animal diversity. You're going to learn about all of these dissection tools, okay? And then you're going to go ahead and have buckets of preserved specimens, okay? <laughs> it's not the tube, okay? It's not... Okay, the specimen, the pathological specimen everybody's been waiting for, and it's definitely not a cadaver. Right? It's a worm, okay? <laughs> it's the grasshopper, it's the crayfish, okay? It's the sea star, not the starfish, right? Okay? And then you finally end up with the rat. Okay? <laughs> so we have these noble pursuits, but what happens is that we run those gambit of all of those different organisms, and we start out with general biology and those dissections. Okay. Now, much to our, our you know, what we've discovered is that what are we doing with this? Okay. Why are we studying these animal diversities and, and what's happening here? Well, the thing is this. Okay, we're beginning to learn okay, where we fit in in this whole scheme, where we fit in in the ecology. Okay, where we fit in evolutionarily wise. Okay, remember, okay, what we're learning here is that we are humans and we're part of this organismal diversity that's part of the Earth's bio. And so what we're learning about here is this. We're learning that there are similarities between us and some of these organisms. Okay, we're learning this at an anatomical level, at a physiological level. Okay? But what's also happening here is that we're learning in a very simplistic manner. We're starting out with that worm. And then what happens is, is we get more and more complex. And what, as we're getting more and more complex, we're going through the course, but we're also not only going through the course's time clock, we're also going through evolutionary time clock. And what we're really developing is what we see here. Okay, next slide please. We're developing our critical thinking skills. Okay, dissections. Okay, what they're doing is that it's a way of getting your gloved hands dirty and developing your critical thinking skills. What we're doing here is developing concepts that you're going to be using and utilizing in your more advanced classes in your professional schools. Okay, now I also teach advanced physiology. I also teach the graduate level of physiology and pathophysiology for our college of health professions. And time and time again, I see all of the critical thinking skills and all of the concepts that are being developed in those dissections being utilized in these professional settings. Now, what's happening here, as I said, we start out with a very simplistic organism. We're looking at different type of organ relationships. We're doing it at a very simple level with the worm. And as we go ahead and develop, we're looking at these more and more over into greater, more complexity. And what results is in something like the heart. Now, when everybody gets to the heart, everybody's like, how do we do critical thinking with the heart? Well, it's all critical thinking. So if you go ahead and everybody in this room probably went ahead and got the sheep heart. So when you have that sheep heart, you look at it and you say, hmm, how do I deal with this? Well, we know that the left ventricle is the one that has to push the blood through the whole body. And therefore, it has to work harder than the right which means it's going to have a thicker wall. So now we can distinguish the right from the left. But the thing is, is that everything on the left side of the body occurs in twos. 
Everything on the right occurs in threes. So now that we know that this thicker walled ventricle okay, is in the left part, we know that it's going to push blood out the aorta, but we know that the associated valve, because it's on the left, is your bicuspid. We know that the blood that's going to leave okay, and pass into the aorta is going to go to the right. When it goes to the right, it's going to go through three blood vessels, the brachiocephalic, the right common carotid, and the right subclavian. If it's going to go to the left, it's going to go through two, okay? the left common carotid and the left subclavian. These are all concepts okay, that you just start out as a freshman, and you start putting these together. But then what happens is, is that you're going to see these again in your advanced physiology class, your advanced anatomy class. And then you're going to see them in the professional school that you're going to go to. And it's going to be much easier because you're going to have these skills and you're going to be ready to go. Next slide, please. Now, I experienced this. My own personal experience is with stingrays. As a freshman, I went through the animal diversity. And I, at that time, couldn't even imagine that I would be working with Daisyatus sabina, which is the Atlantic stingray. Now, what happened is, is that that experience equipped me. I knew the difference amongst the chondrichthys. You know, the difference between a shark, a stingray, and a skate. I knew what their internal anatomy was. I knew what their physiology was at a foundational basic level. But then what I did is I looked at this organism and I said, I want to know about the morphology of the inside of the structure. So what I did is I did some scanning electron microscopy, and then I went ahead and looked at the epithelia, and then the arrows on the bottom. You can see our blood vessels. So I understood the vasculature. Then I did some transmission electron microscopy. What I did over here was looked at the cells and saw how they were connected. What were the junctions between them? What was the difference between their different membranes? And then what I did is took this and did some electrophysiologic work. Now the electrophysiologic work I did with this was investigating where ions are moving. So I investigated not only what ions are moving and in which direction, but how they're interacting with each other. Now, you might wonder, like, well, what's the contribution to that? Okay, and what does that have to do with the grand scheme of things? Okay, well, what it does is this. Next slide, please. It goes ahead, and it's a model system for understanding how cystic fibrosis works. So who would have thought, okay, me as a freshman, would have gone ahead and gone through this diversity experience and then go ahead and wind up getting my PhD investigating the morphological and electrophysiologic features of the Atlantic stingray's alkaline gland. Now, cystic fibrosis is a disease that afflicts, afflicts the lungs. And so what happens here is that people have a problem moving chloride. And if you have a problem moving chloride, you can't hydrate your mucus very well, and then your airways get clogged up. But a lot of people don't realize that there's other problems with cystic fibrosis. And my bowel system is dealing with the, or the pancreatic duct that is occurring okay, in humans. So what happens is, is that this pancreatic duct is doing the same things that the alkaline gland is doing. It's moving chloride through something called the CFTR, the trans, or cystic fibrosis transmembrane regulator. And then that's allowing bicarbonate to move with it. What's happening is, is that not only do you have lots of fluid moving through that duct, but what also happens is you neutralize the acids of the stomach, and then you allow the enzymes in the body to work. So it's very difficult to study the, the pancreas. It's very <laughs> difficult to study what's happening in the pancreatic duct, because it's in humans, and it's small, and it's difficult to get. What happens, though, is, is using a model system, What's happening is, is that now we can look at it and use it to study different drugs and how they interact to help people who have cystic fibrosis. Now, this all began with developing critical thinking skills. It all began, really, investigating the animal diversity in dissecting freshman lab specimens. And what happens is, is that you will start getting this training in critical thinking, but it's not technical training. Okay? So technical training is just doing. 
This is critical thinking. This is taking it that extra step further. So when people enter these professions, you're not going to be a technician and do technical work. You're going to be doing investigative work. That's the driving force of medicine. That's the driving force of all the different careers that people want to pursue in healthcare. So why do we do dissections? Why do we go through this? It's the beginning. It's the practice. It's the beginning of something that you're going to develop further and further and further until penultimately you're going to come up with something and look at things differently and say, hey, this organism does this better, this one does this better, this one doesn't do it at all. But what does it mean and how can we use that to understand medicine better? Okay. Thank you.